Whenever I hear this song, it makes me a little teary. It's a very powerful song. Someone is praying for you. I want to thank you, Elder Glendin, for your kind words. Whenever people introduce me, it makes me sweat. Um, and my hands are wet at the moment. And it's because I don't like much to be said about me. I just simply like you to bring the preacher on and let him, let him speak. Folks, it's really a pleasure to see all of us today. Um, I didn't recognize I'd be preaching at 1224, but the song said someone is praying for you. So I know there is someone praying for the preacher today. I want to just take this opportunity to just say thank you to God for making today possible. We are back in church. I know there are a lot of you who are still at home looking at us. I want you to know we are back in church. And that means you can slowly make your way back. We are getting back there slowly, but by God's grace. And those of you who are viewing online, we want to make a commitment to you that these services we have will continue to be streamed. And you will always remain a part of our family. And uh, let me put on the register our appreciation to our PA team who is working today and have been working for the many months to keep us streaming. There's a lot of work that has gone behind the scenes. And I just want to thank God for making it possible. This morning, I am tempted to do my message in two parts, so I don't have to rush. Um, but the good news is that there isn't much of us here, so you would not want to leave the preacher preaching alone. When there is a lot of people in the church, you can sleep out easily without being seen. Nevertheless, I want to bring to you a, a message of encouragement today, surviving in your wilderness, surviving in your wilderness. Let us pray. Father in heaven, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. Take this simple message and speak to someone's heart, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, before I begin, I want to just uh, express our condolences of the church to the family of Sister Joy Lawrence, Brother George Lawrence, lost his brother in St. Kitts. And uh, we want to let you know, Brother Lawrence, that we are praying for you. Um, his brother passed away a few days ago. And we also lost Sister Rennie, um, um, Eudora Rennie. Now, she, I, I just met Sister Rennie. She dresses in white. She come, she, sit, she sat in the back there. Uh, I think she'll live in Ladbroke Grove or something of that sort. But she's from Grenada. You know, I met Sister Rennie as a little boy in Subi's church in Grenada. And after many years, I didn't see her until I came to Wilson. And she said, what are you doing here? I said, I came to Pastor Wilson. She said, well, I'm going back to Grenada next week. And so she left and went back and came back during the COVID. And she's been sending her tithe to this church. And um, regularly, um, and um, she went to the hospital, and her, she doesn't have any children, but her nieces did not know which church in London she went to. And so she went to the hospital, died there, and they were trying to find out which church did she go to. This week, I connected with them, and they said, do you know Sister Rennie? I said, of course I know Sister Rennie. Um, so the body will be flown back to Grenada, but I want to just express to her family. Most of them live towards the north of England, our heartfelt condolences, and um, we want you to know that you are in, in, our, in our prayer. Um, I remember Sister Rennie cooked a plate of oil dung for me one time, you know, and I was doing Bible work in the Caribbean, 
And, um, you know, uh, we had a crusade in Subis, and she cooked a plate of oil down. <laughs> I, can't, I can't forget that. Wonderful lady, wonderful Christian lady. Who got me there talking about oil down this morning? <laughs> surviving, surviving in your, in your wilderness. We are living in a wilderness of uncertainty. Uh, since the onset of the pandemic, our lives have been thrown upside down. In many respects, we have to accept new norms like wearing or face mask and self-isolating and quarantining yourself, working at home, online schooling, online meetings, online church. I, I believe some of us have felt zoomed out, if not zoomed in. The freedom to travel is no longer a luxury and uh, we may be looking down the road at vaccine certificates as a requirement to enter some countries. In fact, I've heard even some of the islands in the Caribbean saying that unless you are fully vaccinated, they are not allowing you to come if you're a non-national. Jobs that once were considered indispensable are now being made redundant. And many employers are finding now that you can work at home and be just as effective. Consequently, our lives have been thrown in a quandary. Many people are living in an air of uncertainty. You are not even sure if you should return to church. You are not even sure what is the right thing to do. This morning, I want you to know that it doesn't matter what the climate is around you. God is still God. He is still able. He controls the temperature. He controls the weather. He controls the circumstances. And so it doesn't matter how tough the last couple of months have been. With Jesus on our side, we will move on to a brighter day. Wildernesses are commonly mentioned in the Bible. In fact, sometimes they are considered in negative and positive lights. They are considered to be places that are barren. Places that are rugged, uninhabited. Places that lend themselves to death, uncultivated, dry and without water. Wildernesses are often infested by wild beasts and serpents. It is associated with rebellion. In fact, uh, when you study the Bible, you find that there are many wildernesses that have been mentioned and some of them have been accrued, both positive and negative experiences. For instance, there is the wilderness of Arabia in Exodus 23 verse 31, which is a place where Israel defeated their enemies. You have the wilderness of Beth Avon in Joshua 18, which is a place of vanity. There is the wilderness of Beersheba, the place of refreshment. There is the wilderness of Edom, which is known as a place of hostility. Then you have the wilderness of Engidi in 1 Samuel 24, which is a place of hiding. You have the wilderness of Gaza in Acts 8, which is a place of inquiry. There is a wilderness of Judea, which is known in scripture as a place of affliction and hardship. There is a wilderness of sin in Exodus 19, which was the place of God's fury. And in Numbers 27, we have the wilderness of Zin, the place of rebellion. Wilderness have been given negative connotation in scripture. But on the other hand, Wilderness has also been shown to be a place where God can manifest himself. It was in the wilderness that God miraculously supplied bread from heaven and quail in Exodus chapter 16. It was in the wilderness that God caused water to come out of a dry rock so that the people who were thirsty could be fed. It was in the wilderness that Jesus went to be tempted. It was in the wilderness that John went preaching the gospel of salvation. Folks, 
some good things can happen in wildernesses. And in the Bible, we see Jesus beginning his ministry in the wilderness. Our passage this morning, Israel, having spent 70 years in Babylonian captivity, at Isaiah chapter 41, their wilderness of punishment and divine judgment was over. Those years, I'm talking about the 70 years, sapped their life out of them. They not only lost their hope, they lost their song. They said, by the rivers of Babylon, where we sat down and there we wept. While we remembered Zion, how can we sing the Lord's song, they asked, in a strange land. Israel, while they were going through the Babylonian wilderness, they lost their testimony. They were overtaken by fear and by despair. And so in Isaiah chapter 41, God is about to give Israel some hope. But to understand Isaiah 41, let me take you back contextually to Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah chapter 40 to 48 gives the context of understanding Isaiah 41. The people of Israel went into captivity because of their sins. The exile was an expression of God's judgment. The exile was a time when God's people were allowed to reflect on what they have done wrong. And I'm sure that the last couple months provided opportunities for reflection on where we are with the Lord, how far we have drifted with from him or how close we have come to him the exile provided that opportunity in fact Israel thought in Isaiah 40 and verse 2 that God was repaying them double for their sins and sometimes the problems of life may make you seem that God is repaying you double for your sins. And so the prophet and those who follow him are charged with giving comfort to God's people. The message of comfort was also proclaimed by Jesus and all the disciples. Isaiah was charged with letting the people know that it doesn't matter what you have been through, even though you deserve it, God does not desert his people when they are in trouble. God does not desert his people when they are in crisis. In fact, God's beauty and his grace shines more prominently when you are down in the quagmire. God's beauty and his love is seen when things are at their lowest ebb. And so in Isaiah chapter 40, God announced that salvation will be coming to his people. Precisely where the people of God are, they were in Babylon thinking of going back home, thinking of that journey. And the fact that God has caused them to go into captivity. Can this God deliver them and protect them as they leave? Folks, I want to say to us this morning that the same God who allowed, he did not cause, he allowed what happened in this world to happen. This same God can bring us out of it. This same God who causes the rain to fall and the sun to shine, he can also withhold the rain and withhold the sun. God is not limited. And so in Isaiah chapter 40, the good news focus on the fact that God is present with his people. Whether you are in Babylonian captivity or not, God is with you. God does not desert us because we're in isolation. God does not come back when we're out of isolation. God has never left his church. 
It doesn't matter if we were worshiping at home, away from each other. The presence of the Lord has always been with us. Brothers and sisters, though we were separated, we were never alone. There were angels that worship with us. Though we were away from each other, God was not away from us. The good news this morning is that God never leaves us nor forsake us. And so God is about to give the children of Israel some words of encouragement as they come out of their wilderness experience. And so in Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 40, the Lord said to Isaiah, I want you to remind the people for me that I am the same God who caused them to go into captivity and I'm the same God who will take them out of captivity. It is not what people say, it is what God is saying. Folks, I know we have to respect the sciences and what is being said out there. But the one who controls this world is God. I'm sure you have not recognized that not even the scientists understand what is happening around us. There is more confusion in the world of science than you ever think. The one who determines what happens in this world is God. He is the one who sits high and looks low. Fear not this morning. You may have read the news and your heart may have failed you because of what you are hearing. The prognosis may look bleak on the outlook. But folks, when you look up, you recognize that God still got the world in his hand. The little children has a song they sing, in his hands. He's got the whole world. Well, he does not just have the whole world. He's got you and me in his hand. I thank God this morning that he's got the whole world in his hand. And so in Isaiah chapter 41, our passage for meditation this morning, Isaiah chapter 41, the Lord said to Isaiah, reading from verse 17 or scripture reading, when the poor and the needy seek water, and there is none, and their tongue is patched with dust, I, the Lord, will answer them. I, the God of Israel, will not forsake them. Well, folks, to understand this passage, we need to go back. So why is it the poor and the needy is seeking water? In fact, Isaiah chapter 41 verse 17 speaks of a community in lament. Lamenting about a time of drought. But it also gives us, it also gives us the assurance that God hears us when we lament. The key to understanding Isaiah chapter 41 lies in understanding what they were going through where they were. The message of consolation given in Isaiah chapter 41 is enclosed by two arguments. Isaiah chapter 41 verse 1 to 7 and Isaiah chapter 41 verse 21 to 29 where God speaks to the surrounding nations. God addresses the nations around Israel because they were wondering, is God able to protect us against those nations that brought us into captivity? The nations are called by God into a tribunal and God announces to them that you are not in control. I used you as an instrument to punish my people, but I am I'm the one in control. That's why in Isaiah chapter 41 verse 4, the Lord says, I the Lord, I am he. I am the one who is in charge. It is not you, Babylon. It is not you, Cyrus. I am he who is in charge. Folks, this morning, I have come by to let you know that the God 
of Jacob is in charge. I am he. He is the God of yesterday. He is El Shaddai. He is the bright and morning star. He is the lily of the valley. I've come by to let you know that God, the Alpha and the Omega, he is still in control. I know we seem, it may seem to us that things have gotten out of control, but not with God. He is still in control. So in Isaiah, in Isaiah, while God, God speaks to the nation, uh, he says that he will not protect those who oppose his people. They will perish, he says. Isaiah chapter 41, verse 11 to 16. He says that he will destroy them because God is the redeemer of his people. He is the holy one. He is the one who protects them. And that's why he says to his people, when the poor and the needy, this is referring to people in captivity. Those coming out of captivity. When the poor and the needy, need water. God understands here that these people are poor in spirit. They are poor in their hope, needy of his protection, needy when the poor and the needy. Israel did not just need water. Israel needed direction. Israel needed some solitude. Israel needed some assurances. God says when the poor and needy today more than ever people need hope. People need the Lord. People need encouragement. People need to know that all hope is not lost. That even when things look bleak, that the God of Isaac, of Abraham and Jacob, he is still God and in control. He says when the poor and the needy need water, I the Lord. I, the Lord, will answer them. God is showing here that he's able to care for his people. He said he's able to bring rivers, springs, and pools of water in the desert. Listen, folks, deserts are not places where you find water. Deserts are not places where you find a river. But the Lord says... I will open rivers in the bare heights and fountains in the valley and make the wilderness a pool of water. In other words, God is able to transform your wilderness into a lake. God is able to transform your barrenness into fountains of water. Hey, folks. I want to, you know, help me to preach this thing this morning. God says that your wilderness can become a fountain of water. It tells me this morning that it doesn't matter how bad things look with you. With God, there is hope. With God, there is a future. Your barrenness, your emptiness, your loneliness, your forgottenness, God can turn it around. He can make it right. Now, listen to me, I and I pastored in Kariaku in Grenada, and in Kariaku there is no river. So we collect the water from the uh, roof when the rain falls and goes into a cistern below the house and that's what you use a pump to pump it up and one time I forgot the pump and the entire cistern ran out of water and when the cistern when the water is in the cistern goes you have to either buy water or get water somewhere else and I tell you this, brethren, when you don't have water, it's not an easy thing. I'd rather to be without food than water. Because without water, your life is thrown in chaos. 
And I remember, I remember, you know, that time when I had no water in Carico. I had to call a member from church who had a truck, but the truck was broken down. And he had to take a truck of water. I was living on top of a hill, but in Grenada, we like the hills. And the truck could not go up the hill. And for many days, I did not have water. When you don't have water, it can be very, very difficult. You can't shower. You can't cook. It's just a chaotic scene. Listen, folks. God understands that one of the greatest need that people can have is for water. But let me tell you this. When God supplies your need, he doesn't just send a bucket. He sends the river. He didn't say, I'm going to bring a bottle of water. He says, I'm going to open the rivers. It tells me this morning, brothers and sisters, the God we serve, he owns the well. I know there are some of you who have lost your jobs. Some of you have been made redundant. You are wondering where next? How will I make it? You don't know what the future looks like. I've come by this morning to let you know your God will provide. He has done it in the past and he will do it again. Anyway, let me get to the message this morning. Then you haven't started yet, you know. Let me get to the message quickly. <clears throat> now, I would be happy if God provided water. But this text gets exciting in verse 19. Now, I was planning to bring some object lessons with me. Maybe another time. I was planning to bring some trees with me, but I, was, I had to call Ella Leslie to bring his truck. But next time, Ella Leslie. This text gets exciting in verse 19. Listen to what the Lord says. I will put in the wilderness the cedar, the acacia, the myrtle, the olive. I will set in the desert the cypress, the plain, and the pine. Now, I know you tend to read this and you run quickly to verse 20. But let us stop by verse 19 for a minute. God said he is going to plant seven trees in your wilderness. Now, the message today is surviving in your wilderness. How do you survive? Plant trees. You see, folks, this is such an exciting verse in the Bible. Why does God want to plant trees in your wilderness? Now, they tell me the best prospect of water is trees. And that's why today the environmentalists are fighting to keep our rainforest alive because they recognize that if our trees are gone very soon our water supply will go but God is smart you know this God is intelligent he didn't just say I'm going to open fountains he said I'm going to plant trees because God doesn't send water for a day. He wants water to keep flowing and flowing and flowing. Now, why seven? Why seven trees? If you, 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 you can count them there. Now, some versions have different names for the trees and that's because uh, we are still unsure as to what type of trees they were, biblically. But whichever seven you have in your Bible, let's look at them. Why does God choose seven trees? You see, the number seven is one of completeness. It tells me, 
God wanted to plant seven trees in the wilderness to show us that whatever he starts, he brings to completion. If God starts something, he completes it. He never starts and stops. Listen to me. If God started a good thing in you, Philippians 1, 6 says, being confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. If God started you on this Christian pathway, he will bring you to the very end. Why seven trees? The number seven is indicative that when God restores, he does it in many fold. In this case, sevenfold. God always compensates you more for what you've lost. Israel was about to receive not one tree, but seven trees. And that's why Matthew 19, 29 says, everyone who has left houses and brothers and sisters and fathers for my name's sake shall receive a hundredfold. When God compensates you, he does it in a great way. But why the number seven? Seven points to the all-sufficiency of God. He is able to take care of you in every area of your life. That's why today, God's got you covered. Not partially. Not just in front. He got you covered behind, above, beneath. God's got you covered. There is nothing about you that is not covered by the Lord. Your future is in God's hand. But let me look now at the trees. Now, listen to me, folks. Anything that is written in the Bible is very purposive and intentional. And there are seven trees that everyone must plant in their wilderness to survive. The first one that is mentioned there, the Lord said, I will put in the wilderness the cedar tree. Cedar represents the glory of God. Strength and wealth. It's a tree that is valued for its elegance. And you know, King David built his palace from cedar wood. Uh, I'm sure you read about the cedars of Lebanon that once graced the mountains of Lebanon. They are majestic. The cedar tree are used in the Old Testament. Sometimes they symbolize the relationship that God has with his people. When God works in your life, he plants a tree there to remind you that all the glory must go to the Lord. And thus, in your difficult moments, before God brings you out, you must ensure that you plant your cedar. Because when you look back over your life, you have to say it was God. You see, sometimes God will keep you as long as it takes in your wilderness until the glory goes to him. He wants to make sure that no one takes credit for what happens in your life. He must take the credit. Even in your pain, the glory goes to the Lord. In your abundance, the glory goes to the Lord. He said, I'm going to plant the cedar, you see, Israel came out of Babylonian captivity not because they were strong in number. They came out of Babylonian captivity because God was good to them. In your life, you must ensure that in your wilderness there is something to remind you that God deserves the glory. 
How can you glorify God when things are bad? Well, folks, you don't praise him for your circumstance. You praise him because you know he is God. Not only should you plant your cedar tree there, but he said you should also plant your acacia. <laughs> hey, the acacia tree was the tree that was used in the sanctuary. <laughs> it was the tree that was used when we want to come to worship. Listen to me, folks. The time you need to worship God the most is in your wilderness. So God, God said, I'm going to plant in the wilderness an acacia tree. In fact, the acacia in the Hebrew is also called the shittim tree. Uh, in fact, uh, this tree was not a very good looking tree. It was, it, it, it was a very rugged tree. It was a tree that, that was not too beautiful to look upon. But in the sanctuary, the acacia was covered with gold and sometimes silver and sometimes bronze. And when given to God, it became useful. And so folks, in your wilderness, there must be some worship. Worship God! Because he is worthy of your praise. In fact, not only should you worship God, but the acacia tree reminds us that God wants to use you in your experience to be of service to his cause. Don't think that everything bad that happens to you is necessarily bad for the cause of God. Sometimes the only way God can save us is in our wilderness. He said, I'm going to plant there the acacia tree to remind you that I am the God who wants you to be steadfast. I want you to worship me. I want you to be of service to me. You are coming out of your wilderness experience, but I want you to remember that God can still be worshipped in spite of your circumstance. Not only are you to plant the acacia tree, but he said in first in Isaiah 41 verse 19, I will plant also the myrtle tree. Well, the myrtle tree is a very common and indigenous tree to Palestine. It grew to considerably height and myrtle gives off a fragrance. It was used to produce oil and it's a tree that reminds us that God has been generous to us. The myrtle tree reminds us that God wants us to be a blessing to others. Not just be useful to him, but he wants you to be a fragrance to others. You see, folks, in your wilderness experience, you can still be of good to others. I know some people wait until you are blessed to bless others. But you know, the best time to bless others is in your scarcity. You know, God wants you to be a blessing in your wilderness. Be, you know, you know, you see folks, what you are actually doing there by planting your myrtle tree, you are reminding others that what you give is not because of what you have. You don't give because you have enough. You give because God has kept you alive. Little is much. Some people say, well, I don't have much, so I can't give. No, the myrtle tree reminds us that even in your wilderness experience, you can be faithful. God sustains his children. He makes them a fragrance to others. He makes them a blessing to others. The myrtle tree was to remind Israel. That as you sojourn in your wilderness, don't just drink the water for yourself. 
Don't just be fat and enjoy my blessing. Give it away. Share it. In fact, when you share it, it will come back. Trees bring more water. And you will find that when you give of your little, you are opening the door for things to happen. Plant your myrtle tree, folks. Some of us, the best way for you to receive of God is for you to open your hands and your hearts. Open that which you have to others because you will find the more you give. Luke 6.38 says, give and it will come back to you. Good measures, pressed down, shaken together. I know things are hard, but it is when things are hard, you must give. Not only should we plant the myrtle tree, but he says, I'm going to plant also the olive. Hey, folks, we got to plant some olives. The olive tree, these were small trees. And, and, and in, in fact, the garden of Gethsemane was actually an olive garden. Uh, the olive tree was, you know, it's a tree that reminds us that to get something useful, we must be pressed together. We must go through the crucible. Jesus went through the crucible of Gethsemane. The olive, uh, the olive wood was used for the post in the temple. And the oil was used to light the, lantern, the lamps in the temple. But more than that, the olive was medicinal. It was used for healing. Listen folks, God wants you to remember in your wilderness experience, he is the God who heals you. Uh, you got to plant a tree that reminds you that healing comes from the Lord. Yes, I know that we are doing our best to stay healthy, but healing comes from the Lord and God wanted Israel to know you should not trust in men as good as they are. You must trust in the Lord for your healing. The mother, the olive tree rather, reminds us that God is your Jehovah Rapha. The God who remembers you. The God who can heal you. The God who can deliver you. So in my garden, i got to plant a tree that reminds me that God is still the healer. Listen to me, folks. There is still a healer in the house. His name is Jesus. He's the great physician. If you haven't tested him, just plant your olive tree. And when you look at it, you must remember, I am alive today, not because of the medications. I'm alive today because of God. The doctors gave me a few years and I'm still here. It's because I've planted my olive tree. And it reminds me that God is my doctor. Not only should I plant the olive tree, but he said you must plant also the cypress or the box tree. Listen, folks. The cypress, this, were, this is the tree that was used to build the ark of Noah. It's also called the gopher wood. And uh, the, the cypress tree is a tree that is very hard. It, it can withstand a lot of pressure. Yeah, yeah. It's hardness makes it very good for building furniture and, 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 and such. It's called the hard wood. Hence, Noah used it to build the ark. I want you to know that God wants you to plant your cypress tree or your box tree to remind you that he is your protector. He is your shield. He is your defender. And thus, when you go through your wilderness, you need to remember that your ability to stay alive is in God's hand. He is the one, just as Noah built an ark with the cypress tree, God wants you to know that his banner over you is love. He can protect you by day and by night. He is your 
your cypress tree. He's your gopher wood. He can be for you a rock in a dreary land. He is your refuge that you can run to. That is God. Your divine protector. And so, when you survive in your wilderness with all these trees around you, brethren, who can be against you? You are surrounded with God's protection, God's healing. You are surrounded with the fact that God is the one who has you here. Who can be against you? That's why the, the, Paul, the Apostle Paul says, if God is for you. Let me go quickly on to the next tree. Uh, uh, in some version calls it the plan or the plain tree. Um, in fact, this tree is quite a debated tree. Uh, some folks uh, are wondering what type of tree um, is it. Uh, sometimes um, it is uh, believed that this tree is equivalent to the fig or the sycamore tree in the New Testament that we are still not sure. However, however, that's a tree that strips it, its bark and it becomes bare to the open elements. Um, this plain tree reminds us that God wants us to be totally surrendered, totally dependent. He wants you to become vulnerable to him just as the plain tree strips its back and becomes subjected to the elements of nature. God wants you to remind, he wants to remind us that we must also be totally dependent on him we must come bear to him we must give him everything lay all our burdens at his feet tell jesus all that 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 perplexes you uh yes the sycamore tree reminds us that god wants your absolute surrender he wants you to keep nothing back from him you must give him your everything and then the final tree is the pine or the fir tree. Some versions have pine, some has the fir tree. Now this tree was used to make musical instrument. And it's interesting that God wants you to plant a tree to remind us that in your wilderness, you must have a song. Come on, somebody. You must have a song to sing that tells you of the goodness of God. Come on, am I talking to somebody this morning? I'm saying God wants you to plant your pine tree, your fir tree, so that when you look back over your life, you have a song. My favorite song is, And Can It Be? And Can It Be? That I should gain an interest in my Savior. Died he for me. Who causes pain? For me to hear. I can't even remember the words now. Death pursuit. Amazing love. That's what I love. How can it be that thou, my God, should die for? Now, I don't know what is your song. But when you're in your wilderness, you need to have a song. That when you sing it, when you read the words, it reminds you of where the Lord has brought you from. That song is a song you may not have the voice to sing it, but sing it. God says when you're in your wilderness, yes folks, you must have a song to sing. That tells of the goodness of God. And so God wanted Israel as they come out of the Babylonian captivity. Plant trees around you to remind you that you ought not to go back. Remember where you were. Sing to tell of the blessings of the Lord. Remember that I want you to be totally surrendered. Remember that I'm your shield and protector. Remember 
that I'm the God who heals you. Remember that I want you to be a blessing to others. Remember that I want you to be of use to me. And I want you to be of service in the cause of God. But also remember that I'm the God who deserves the glory in your life. And when you remember these things, rain must fall. Because you will remain faithful to the Lord. Folks, we are living in difficult times. But these are the times when God wants you to shine for him. Today, I don't know about you, but I'm thankful to the Lord that in my wilderness experience, I'm going to remember him. I'll remember him as the God who deserves my glory, the God who heals, the God who delivers. I must sing of the goodness of the Lord. This is my testimony today. I don't know what wilderness experience you are going through today. I don't know what wilderness you have come through. But I want you to plant trees of faithfulness to God. So that no matter how long you stay in your wilderness, you will continue to experience the favor of God. Today, today is a good opportunity for you to covenant with God. Come what may, you will remain faithful to him. Come what may, you will keep a song in your heart. Come what may, you will remember his divine protection over your life. Today, you may uh, have listened to this message online. You may be here in church listening to me. And you want to say to me, Pastor, by the grace of God, I want to survive in my wilderness. I'm going through my patch of wilderness now. But by the grace of God, I'm going to remember the God I serve. I'm going to remember what he has done. I'm going to give him praise in my wilderness. I'm going to be a blessing to others in my wilderness as I wait on God to bring me out. If that's your prayer today, just raise your hand as I pray for you. God bless you. God bless you. Let us pray. Father in heaven, each of us is going through something today, oh God. Some of us is more dire than others. Some of us, oh God, we are at a breaking point. But this message this morning is designed to encourage us, to let us know that we can make it. We can survive if we plant those trees that remind us of who you are and what you've done. Today, oh God, help us to plant those trees in our wilderness so that we can be nourished by you and nourish others, even in our dire circumstances. Today I pray for someone who is at the verge of giving up, someone who is about to throw in the towel, oh God. I ask, Father, that you will help them to plant those trees, that they will experience your goodness in their lives. And so today, Lord, into your hands, I commit the entire congregation and those online. May someone today plant trees, I pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, before I end today, brethren, I, it just dawned on me. I want us to just, you know, <clears throat> there is a gentleman that I am currently studying with in my area up at Houghton Regis. And he has a lot of questions. <clears throat> Yesterday, we had a very interesting discussion, just texting. And he said to me, how do I know God exists? And right now, I want us to pray as a church family before we end this service. It just came to my mind. The Spirit just brought it, so I want to tell it to you. He said to me, how do you know God exists? I gave him some theological answer, but he said, I'm not convinced. And I said to him, I've experienced God. He said, what do you mean? I said, you've got to experience him yourself. He said, what do you mean? I said, let's pray. <clears throat> now, I 
know one person here who knows that gentleman. Now, this morning, he texts me and he said, no, it's, a, it's, a, it's a white guy, British guy. He said to me, I've been praying and nothing has been happening. You said God reveals himself to us when we pray. So I just got another message from him saying, I'm still praying and nothing is happening. And so I said to the Lord, Lord, please reveal yourself to him. More than what theology can do, reveal yourself to him in a way that he will know that God exists. So right now, brethren, right now, right now, join me. Join me right where you are. And let us just pray for this gentleman. He wants God to reveal himself to him. I said, I've experienced him. He said, well, can I have that experience too? And he said he's praying, but he hasn't had that experience. So just let's join right now, folks. Um, just for a minute, and just let's ask God to please reveal himself to this gentleman. Thank you very much. <laughs> 